Hello, I'm Kamla. On today's show, we feature two guests, Linda Puglio, a serial entrepreneur, and Dr. Christina Yu, a scientist. Linda Puglio is a serial entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. Until a few years ago, she was working in New York. Linda decided to give it all up and come to Silicon Valley to found a company. She did not know what kind of a company. All she knew was she wanted to start one. Linda shares how she became a tech entrepreneur and what she learned from her experience as a first-time entrepreneur. Welcome, Linda. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Nothing in your life prepared you for this because you majored in fine arts and you grew up in Long Island. Yes, it's true. Silicon Valley is very different. <laughs> <laughs> how much does it parallel the HBO series Silicon Valley, your life? Uh, you know, my recent startup is very much, I feel like, could be an episode of Silicon Valley. <laughs> in what way? Just the craziness that I'd always heard of, of uh, investors really driving uh, to want to invest and some of the market demands is, it feels like a TV show sometimes. <laughs> so did you ever have an investor like the investor in the HBO series who has a card that opens like this? <laughs> We did not, but what we did have was before we'd started the company, a investor wanted to write us a check and we didn't even have the company name yet. So what happened? Paperwork. Oh, so we took it. We just, we just on the spot said, okay, this is, this is what we're going to call a company. <laughs> w w did you kind of die and go to heaven and come back? That it somebody was, actually gave you money without a company? It was super fun. <laughs> <laughs> that was when you know you make it. <laughs> did you pinch yourself? <laughs> But you also have taught at Stanford as a lecturer, and you mentioned that you used uh, the HBO series Silicon Valley as a template. Yes. That's actually why I wanted to, that experience that happened to me of someone giving us a check without actually having, you know, all our ducks in a row was what wanted me to teach others of like, yes, you know, here's some real life lessons that you can take in the show, and here's what is real, and here's where you know, it's fiction. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you co-founded a company called Nito, which was a robotic company, and it was, I guess, in direct competition with iRobots, uh, what is the name? iRobot Roomba. Roomba, yeah, which I've used. It goes round and round and does a good job. Um, why did you decide to co-found a robotic company? You had no experience in software, hardware, robots, AI, nothing. Sure. I came to Silicon Valley and I knew I wanted to do a company. I didn't know what. Uh, and I had a Roomba and I was not thrilled with its performance. And I was lucky enough to meet someone who was an engineer background who was planning to start a company. And he said, I'm going to build a robot company. And we just started over pizza talking about, well, what is that company going to be? And I was interested enough. And then we started to talk about my you know, my lack of faith in Roomba and how potentially it could be done better. And that was the, uh, the spark the genesis. that started, you know, further conversations that then ultimately became Nito Robotics. Okay, and so this was your neighbor who was going to Stanford? Yes. Okay. And what really happened was uh, I did know enough about how companies can get, product could get made because I had an operations background. And so while I didn't know hardware, I was very confident that I could find the right people to talk to in China and have the thing made. Oh, so this was made in China? The robot. Ultimately, the robot was made in China. Okay, so uh, let's step back quickly. You had this operation background because for 10 odd years, you had worked in New York mm -hmm. in the B2, business to business space. And mm -hmm. so you were working with different vendors and getting your product. Uh, yeah, basically what I did was I would have product made from a design all the way through production. And so companies that we would work with would be ones like Banana Republic or Disney or um, most of the museums in the around the country and around the world worked with us. So a variety of product and we would, you know, pitch a client on what the thing should look like and then I would have to go and find someone who could actually make it and oversee the manufacturing and bring it back and make sure it was... So you wouldn't even have a product but you would pitch a client a potential product? Mm -hmm. So you kind of knew how to do this? Right. You knew that you could pitch a product and then you have to scramble at the back end yes. to assemble all the people and get the product out? Exactly. So you don't take no for an answer? Right. So getting the yes from the, the, the customer was the most important thing. Yeah, I think if you start with a customer who says, hey, I want this thing, then you can figure out a way to make it. And that was your secret sauce. 
the fact that you knew how to do this. So why did you want to come to Silicon Valley? Because you came at a time when this was going through a terrible, this area was going through a terrible crisis. I figure where else are other entrepreneurs? It just made sense to me. Like, regardless of the economy, other entrepreneurs have been coming here and it's always been a hotbed. And also I love the weather here. <laughs> <laughs> Compared to New York. Some really brutal weather uh, winters in New York and so I was rather pleased to be able to, to transfer. <laughs> so had you followed uh, the stories during the dot-com boom and everything? You had followed the yeah, stories? Yeah, and I had friends. Look, I had friends that had been here and had been very successful in its heyday and then subsequently like had lived through the dark dark phases and had gone back to New York and so you know I eyes wide open knew what, what I was facing here okay so uh, fast forward so you your neighbor says okay he signed you up for this uh, robotic company uh, how did you then end up going with that uh, germ of an idea to writing a business plan and then getting funded and actually bringing out the product Sure. So we actually incubated it at Stanford through a class called S356. And so we looked at all aspects of the business of, you know, we had a few different ideas of potentially what the product could be because there were a whole bunch of areas where you could automate in the home. And so we did that and then we started interviewing custom, potential customers of saying, what do you really want? What are your pain points? We did focus groups and every week we would iterate and iterate and then we started talking with engineers to say okay you know here's a few ideas what would the timeline be if we tackle this technology versus that technology and then ultimately out of that we decided on doing floor cleaning okay so how long did it take for you how many years did it take for you to hone in that floor cleaning is the product that you want to do we knew that within nine months so really actually why Stanford was good was it allowed us the time to figure out through the year that Joe was at, in the Sloan program of, okay, this is going to be the product. And then as soon as he graduated, we put together the team and really started executing. And this was in 2005? Yeah. Okay, and then when did you raise your money? Well, the first $10,000 actually came out of Stanford because we won a competition that was called eChallenge. And then uh, Joe and I put in a little bit of our own money um, and then we very quickly raised some angel money and it took us, we were raising angel money for about a year and a half before we had our first institutional investment. Okay, so this uh, investor that gave you money when you didn't even have a company name, by any chance were you at the Rosewood Hotel <laughs> in Menlo Park when it happened? So that was from my new company <laughs> oh, and it, okay. was, it was someone who who knew us and who loved the idea. We were just saying, hey, we're thinking, it's myself and my co-founder were saying, hey, we're thinking about exploring this idea. And he said, this is, this is fantastic, I want in. Okay, okay. And the it was new, in San Francisco. Oh, it was in San Francisco. <laughs> and the new company is called Dishcraft. Yes. Okay, and it's still in stealth mode. Yes. Okay. Uh, why did you leave Nito? Because uh, Nito today is, I guess, the second most popular product? Uh, it's the second largest robotic vacuum cleaning Cleaner. company. Cleaner, okay. So, I started the company, I had a definite vision of what I wanted to accomplish and part of that was uh, in terms of team and also product. And over the course of developing that, you know, startups change and so ideas change and what you need to execute on change. And one of the things that happened there was we, it's not what the company is doing today, but for a brief time we had considered OEMing mm. and it was just turning into a company that was different and I saw other opportunities elsewhere. I thought I had brought the team up to a certain size and they were very stable and were on a very good path. And so... Um, you left? I left. When was this that you left? I, it was, let's see, probably 2009 or 2010. Okay, so the company just got acquired in 2017, mm -hmm. Nito. Did you benefit from it? Did it no? Yes. I mean, I was, I was an early founder, and so, you know, it was good for everyone. Okay. The reason I'm asking is because you use uh, uh, HBO Silicon Valley as a template, and it's yes. all about four-year vesting. Yes. You know, you have to vest your stocks otherwise. I think one of the things people forget is that from start to finish, it's always a very long mm. period. There's very rare, where Silicon Valley, all of a sudden, you're, like, people are making millions of dollars within a year, and yes, that does happen. Like, Instagram, I think, was a very quick exit. Um, Cruise was probably also a very quick exit. Most are not, and so I think what you need to prepare yourself for when you join a startup is that you know it may be 12 years, it may be 14 years, it may be 20. 
Mm. That was in the old days, 10, 12, 14 years, but I think the dot-com boom accelerated the process yeah. where people got used to having quick exits. Right. I wasn't, I mean, when I started Nido and even when I've started my recent company where I think both are going to be quite, one is already a su success and this one I believe will be a huge success, it wasn't about the money for me. It was about the problem that we were solving, uh, the people that we help with the product, and about putting together a team that I thought would be a pleasure to work with. How are you working with your new company differently? Because there must have been learnings from the first company that you founded that you're probably carrying on to your second company. So what are you doing differently about your second company? Yeah, I think uh, I'm much more practical now. I try to use as much pre-existing um, things to enable getting into a customer's hands much quicker and less invention. Only invent when you really need to. So taking off the shelf as much as I can. Okay. And then I think the other thing, uh, I'm much more careful about culture and what to put together in terms of a team. You know, I think early teams benefit a lot from having people who are like-minded, and then you start to grow upon that to keep expanding out and adding in the diversity. But I think that very first, you know, few people really need to, at their core, to get quick agreement and to stabilize the company need to have um, a lot in common. So what are, what, what are your core values and mission? in this new company? Oh, sure, so we start with respect and communication and accountability. So accountability yes. builds trust and execution. Okay, so trust is very important. Mm -hmm. And was that missing from your previous company? I think that, I think all of us were new to the business. It was our first startup. And I think we didn't put as much time into the people. Hmm. You know, and so we had people, we, I think we experienced a lot more communication issues because we weren't didn't put as much time into making sure that people were aligned. Hmm. So now you're focusing a lot more on getting that core cultural uh, values kind of permeate the entire it's team. It's the first thing you see when you walk in the door. There's a big poster and everyone signs up to it. We've had investors sign up to our values. What does it We've say? Had, you know, respect. It, communication, respect, accountability. Did you come up with that? Uh, the, t the first founding team did, so we spent, you know, a lot of time together carefully crafting it and deciding what the, those values actually meant. Okay. So you are an unusual entrepreneur because uh, there aren't too many entrepreneurs in the robotics in the field, women entrepreneurs, and you are probably one of the early uh, co-founders of a robotic company, and now you're on to a second uh, company. Uh, and you don't have a technical background. You don't have an engineering background. Was that ever a showstopper when you went to raise money with venture capitalists who usually emphasize that there should be a technical person or the founding team should be technical? Well, with my first startup, even though I didn't have a technical background, my co-founder did. So Joe definitely came from a hardware background, and so we had instant credibility that way. And in terms of this company, because I had previously done Nito, yes, I didn't have a technical background, but because of my history, they believed that I could put together the right technical team, and which I have. So it it. It wasn't really a gating factor. There never was an instant where it became a factor because usually people do say, hey, isn't your entire team technically, especially if it's a founding team? So I have, I have a core belief and I tell investors, and so if they don't believe into this, then I'm not a good founder for them, is that you really, the perfect founding team is a triad, that you have a product person, which I am, and you have a salesperson, and you have a technical founder, and those three is the right combination. Now, other many, many successful companies have been purely technical, but sometimes then people lose sight of the business side of it, and I believe that by having those three different distinct functions in the founding team, it's the strongest teams. From robots, we move to biology and living systems with our next guest, Dr. Christina Yu. She's the director of Living Systems at the Exploratorium, a living museum in San Francisco. Christina shares how she developed a deep interest in science in her childhood and how her high school science teacher mentored her. She chose to major in science for her undergrad studies, but midway through her school, she had a change of heart. Could she switch to English literature, she asked her dad. Stick to majoring in science was his advice. Christina got a PhD and landed her dream job at the Exploratorium. Here's our interview with Dr. Christina Yu. Welcome, Christina. Hi, Kamala. So what does a director of living systems do at the Science Museum in San Francisco? So um, 
Living Systems is what we call the biology group at the Exploratorium, and um, I lead efforts to bring biology to our audiences. Mm. Um, we have a laboratory at the museum with um, dozens of different types of live organisms, our living collection, and I help oversee and guide um, how that's used in the museum program. Is it unusual to have a lab at a museum? Um, you know, many museums that have res basic scientific research components have laboratories, but in terms of science centers that are focused on educational um, outreach and activities, it's, it's fairly rare, to my knowledge, to have um, a working biology lab uh, modeled after an academic lab on site. Um, but the lab enables us to raise all sorts of organisms that we then incorporate into our exhibits. Like what kinds of organisms? Oh, we have everything from um, fruit flies to carnivorous plants to um, human heart cells and stem cells. Um, we have zebrafish, um, which are a model organism used in research labs. Um, we have fruit flies, we have chick embryos, you know, lots of stuff. Why would you have uh, carnivorous plants? Why would you have those? Oh, those are, those are really popular for public programs. Um, and plants are a really good entry point for a lot of people who may not identify um, with biology, but you know, lots of people like to garden. Carnivorous plants are really interesting because they, they eat insects, mm. right? So they're- um, Venus flytrap. Exactly, yeah. Okay. So th those are kind of popular. And we, we have a nice greenhouse in our lab so we can actually grow plants. For exhibits. You grew up in a very interesting um, way. You spent your weekdays in the suburbs of Bay Area. Yes. And then weekends, you said you had a feral childhood yeah. <laughs> in this farm <laughs> that your parents decided to buy. <laughs> yes, yeah. Near Clear Lake? Yeah, yeah, between Clear Lake and Lower Lake up in the mountains. What was it like growing up in the farm? You know, what, Fridays you would go to the farm? Right, after school we'd pack up uh, on Friday. Um, you know, my sisters, my parents, the dog, we'd, you know, get into the car, truck, and go up to the farm. And this is like a storybook existence. Uh, kind of. You know, you, <laughs> you know, pile into the car. Into the car, the... drive up there, um, spend the weekend, you know, on, on this acreage that my parents had bought. Doing um, what? Working. And then you had stacks of National Geographic to yes, read. Yes, yes. So up at the ranch, um, at the farm, we, you know, there was no television um, at the house um, at the time. And so we had stacks and stacks of National Geographic from my grandparents. And so in the winter when it was raining, we'd be up there and that was what you did, you know. You, you played board games, you read National Geographic. I read a lot of National Geographic. So you were introduced early on to this uh, natural wonder. Yes, yeah. Uh, were. So were you good at science and math? I was, I think, I like to think that I was. <laughs> I am, was. <laughs> you so, were, so that it was not a struggle? No, no, okay. no. And did you have any mentors uh, that um, helped you through your high school? Yeah, I had a really um, great high school biology teacher um, when I was in, oh, maybe a sophomore in high school, um, Mr. Homan, and... Mr. Homan. Yes, Mr. Homan, and he um, was, you know, he was very stern, but very, supportive and you know I wanted to take extra biology classes which the school didn't have at the time um, so I we designed an independent study that I would it was basically I would hang out in the lab at school and he would give me little assignments or I would do explorations on my own and it was kind of this really nice one-on-one -on -one time. Um, with and you would Mr. answer all your questions. Yeah, or just, you know, explore things, dissect things, um, investigate things. And, you know, uh, Mr. Homan directed me to these um, biology camps that were happening. And oh, there are biology camps? Yes, there were. At, at the time, there were. Um, so, you know, through um, Lawrence Hall of Science, there were biology camps. <coughs> um, Lawrence Hall is uh, Berkeley. Yeah, Berkeley. Mm. Um, so we did that, and um, you know, my parents were really supportive. So it was kind of this really nice, you know, at your own pace um, uh, exploration, and it was great to have, you know, my biology teacher. At my, I, like I didn't have to share with, you know, a bunch of other kids. I could just talk to him. So that was a, a, a really nice time that I think was really formative. So. so then was it decided early on in your mind that biology was the way you were going to go? You know, I, I distinctly remember thinking I wanted to be an ologist of some sort. But I, of an ologist of some sort, but I didn't know what kind, there were so many ologies to study. What, what could I settle on? And I think at the time... Um, you liked the ring of that word. Well, I knew it was, you know, there's like geology and anthropology and biology and all these amazing 
things that you could do. And, and I um, settled on biology, I think, because of um, you know the, the live the nature aspect of it, the live aspect. It's trying to I mean not that the others aren't, but trying to understand um, live, the, the living, living world to uh. some degree. Yeah. So then you decided biology. Biology, yes. Then I also heard when we spoke before mm. uh, the interview, yeah. like all good children, you ran away from home. You wanted to be as far <laughs> away <laughs> from your parents. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you got into all the schools near your hometown. Mm -hmm. But you decided to go to San Diego. Yes, yes, yeah. As far from, yeah, when my parents suggested I take BART <laughs> to university, I was like, oh, that's not going to work. So I went to UCSD um, for biology, um, was there for two years, realized I really missed Northern California, came back. Um, to but again, you stayed far away from uh, home. You see Santa Cruz, it's, it's close. Well, it's on the fringes. Yeah, it's on the fringes. <laughs> <laughs> you still can make an yeah, argument to your trip. parents that yeah. I can't go on 17. Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> My very patient parents. <laughs> um, but once when I was um, at UC Santa Cruz, it was a you know, smaller department, and I wound up volunteering in a lab as an undergrad. Um, and then I stayed to work there after I finished my undergrad, and then that turned into a master's project. And then my advisor said, well, why don't you just stay and do a PhD? So that was kind of my, how I wound up there. So, so um, when you were in your first year, mm -hmm. I believe you called up your dad and said, Dad, I want to change my major. Yes, yeah, that was when I was, when I was in an was undergrad. Was this a well thought out? Uh... No, it was totally impulsive. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think it was again that you know you you go to you go to university and um, you know there are all these things that you can do and study and I really love reading and books and um, writing and and I thought oh you know literature is a, would be amazing and so so I called up my my parents and my dad picked up the phone and I'm, like, I'm going to change my major to literature and he goes well why would you do that and I said because it will make me happy and my dad and all his wisdom tells me well you can be happy on the side <laughs> I think you should stick with the sciences <laughs> and I thought about it for you know a half a second I'm like yeah he's right so um, I mean I still love reading and writing but you know the sciences is sort of the formal path that I took okay yeah. now uh, did you want to do a PhD um, because you wanted to do, you wanted to become an ologist. Yes, yes. You know, yeah, I did. It, I think it was. Or did never, you fall into it? Um, you know, I kind of fell into it, but I, I, I think I would have pursued it otherwise anyway. Um, just because it's, um, you know, it, it, the degree opens doors for you. Um, you, you don't regret having gotten it. I guess mm. is the thing, right? Mm. So, um, and also it, it, you know, graduate school is this. I had a really good experience where it was this wonderful time to just explore questions and you know design your own experiments and in this very collegial, very supportive environment um, that I really enjoyed. So what was your thesis on? My thesis was on um, how cells know how to divide, basically. I worked on one particular protein um, that is involved in telling um, dividing cells whether or not um, they can go ahead and divide because mm. it, it is part of the a mechanism that senses if DNA has been damaged or not. So if a cell divides with damaged DNA, um, it can either be deadly for the cell or it can lead to like precancerous lesions. So it's really important for cells to kind of monitor um, How do they do their state. That? Oh, there's, there's many proteins and um, mechanisms involved with that. There's an entire field called checkpoints that cell cycle checkpoints that's involved in trying to understand that regulation. So, so what did you come away learning about your own body? That these things are happening, right? Your cells are dividing all the time. And that it, and we never think about it. We never it. think about it, and it mostly works, if you, right? There's like... Why do they get damaged? Is there a, is oh, there a known reason? You know, all sorts of things. Um, you know, UV radiation, chemicals, all sorts of... So we don't know effects. the contributory factors? Um, there, there are many. There, Cluster. There's like... There's like probably dozens and dozens of, of known ways that that happens. But I mean, it's a huge, you know, cancer research is very uh, much focused on that. And, but I, I was, I was um, studying one protein you know, that was expressed in the eggs of fruit flies, so it seemed very obscure. Um, but luckily I was able to use um, microscopy to, to study that and kind of unpack that question a little bit. Why do we use fruit flies to study? Are they close to human beings? Um, close, close, close enough. Um, and they're all. I thought this was really interesting when I started in a fly lab. So 
you know, with model organisms, you want something that is um, reasonably similar to humans um, that has um, that, that's easy to grow. So um, you know, kind of inexpensive to maintain, ideally, that generates itself. You know, has a very short generation time. So a fruit fly is about you know a week or two, depending on the temperature, from egg to adult. Um, and you know, fruit flies have been studied for over a hundred years. So there's a lot of background knowledge about them. Um, the other really interesting thing I found out, and I don't know if this is urban legend in the fruit fly community, but but they don't buzz. So, ah. you, so, so, so you can have a lab full of fruit flies and it will be silent. And if you had a lab full of other types of insects, there might be buzzing that would drive you crazy. So, um, you know, that was that was one of the appeals. And they're, they're very small, so you can have a lot of them in a small space. Coming back to your work at the museum, mm -hmm. uh, since you have this microscope imaging station and it's basically a lab, mm -hmm. do you work with other labs in the Bay Area? Yeah, that's a really important part of um, the work that we do at the museum. Um, the greater Bay Area science community really makes our work possible. And we have very long standing relationships and very close ties um, with a lot of folks at you know UC Berkeley, at Stanford, um, UCSF, the Gladstone Institute. and. You know, they support us not only in um, coming up with ideas for exhibits and experiences, but we draw on their expertise for keeping abreast of what's happening in the field. Um, we're always looking to them for new and interesting things that we can build into um, classroom activities or exhibits. Um, you know, they sometimes they actually give us the, the organisms um, on a regular basis that makes, you know, exhibits possible to um, upkeep. And um, yeah, we've, we've had just really wonderful um, relations. Thank you for joining us today. If you missed any of our shows, catch them on our website. I'm on Twitter at Kamla Show. Please join us next week for another new conversation. Until then, goodbye.